1989, I played a game on the Sega Genesis for the first time. The game was one that had captivated me in arcades, and seeing it much closer realized as a home port than what my regular NES was capable of blew me away. The game was Altered Beast. But the game wasn't the main thing that captured my attention that day. That was saved for the sweet Sega control pad. In 1991, the Super Nintendo debuted and my brother brought one home. Although I still felt the Genesis superior, I can no longer argue the controller as his bolstered six action buttons, along with select, start, and a D-pad. It would take two years and the release of Street Fighter, but in September of 1993, the Genesis had its own six action button controller and a game to give players a reason to pick it up. In addition to the three new action buttons, there was one more new button. This is Retro Impressions, let's talk about the mode button. To understand the mode button and issues associated with the six button gamepad, it's important to understand how the Genesis interpolates controller input, starting with the original gamepad. First, let's look at the plug. The Genesis uses a DE9 plug to connect the controller to the system. This was fairly standard at the time and used in such systems as the Sega SG-1000, the Master System, the Atari 2600 and 7800, and the 3DO, among others. This controller port allows for nine connections. Let's go over how it's wired on the Genesis. Pin one is the D-pad, dedicated up. Two is the D-pad, dedicated down. Three is output one. Four, output two. Five is a five volt bus line that sends power to the controller. Six is output three. 7 is the select signal, 8 is a ground line, and 9 is output 4. As you might have noticed at this point, there is only 6 outputs available, yet the 3 button gamepad has 8 total outputs that it's capable of. This is accomplished using a 4 connection 2 to 1 multiplexer chip. In simple terms, this chip allows two inputs to be sent via a single output. The Genesis sends a request via the select signal saying, Hey controller, what buttons are currently pushed on the high side? Followed by a request saying, Hey controller, what buttons are currently pushed on the low side? It could take as little time as 20 microseconds for an inquiry to register an answer. The cycle of requesting the high result followed by the low result will continue until the system is powered off. Let's go back to the controller plug and see exactly how the input buttons are wired. Pin 1 is dedicated up. 2 is dedicated down. 3 is left. It's assigned to the high side. 4 is right. It's assigned to the high side as well. 6 is button B, assigned to the high side, and button A, assigned to the low side. 9 is button C, assigned to the high side, and start assigned to the low side. So with that covered, it's onto the much more complex six button controller. In addition to the three extra action buttons, we are also given a mode button. So what's it for? Well, the simple answer is backwards compatibility. If the user held the mode button when turning on the system, it allowed the controller to function like a three button control pad. This solved issues with certain older titles that would act bizarrely when played in six button mode. This doesn't really answer questions as to why issues were happening or how the button actually works. So let's cover it. Let's start where a controller meets console at the plug. It's wired identical to the three button control pad. There are still only six outputs, but now there are four new inputs that need to be dealt with. So how was this accomplished while still maintaining backward compatibility with nearly all games? Inside, we find the multiplexer chip used in the three button absent. Sega has instead opted for a custom microcontroller. The Sega 315 5638 was only used in this controller and in the controller for the Sega Nomad. It's designed to work very similar to the 2 to 1 multiplexer used in the 3 button with a few key differences. The 3 button controller cycles every pulse group. To be clear, a pulse group is one high signal followed by one low signal. The 6 button has an internal counter that executes four distinct pulse groups before resetting and starting again. Let's go back to the controller plug and look at how the new inputs are assigned. 
Pin 1 is no longer dedicated, with up assigned on the high and low side. The Z button is assigned here as well, on what I will refer to as the extended high side. 2 is no longer dedicated with down assigned on the high and low side. The Y button is assigned to the extended high side. 3 is left, it's assigned to the high side. The X button is assigned to the extended high side. 4 is right, it's assigned to the high side. The mode button is assigned to the extended high side. Let's look at exactly how the controller works in different situations, starting with how the controller works when the game supports a six button controller. The first and second pulse group are identical to the three button gamepad. The third pulse group is used for games to identify as six button compatible. If the game identifies as six button compatible, the controller sends the data for the new buttons during the fourth pulse group on what I referred to earlier as the high extended line. At the end of this group, the counter resets the chip and the pulse group starts over. Next, let's look at how the controller works when the game doesn't support a six button controller. The first and second pulse group are again identical to the three button controller. The third pulse group is used for games to identify as six button compatible. If the game not identifies as six button compatible, the counter resets and starts the cycle again with pulse group one. Because the counter resets the controller after the third pulse group, the fourth pulse group isn't used. So what happens with games that have issues with this controller? There are a few issues that can happen, but let's start with the basics. The first and second pulse group are identical to the third button controller. The third pulse group is used for games to identify as six button compatible, and for a few reasons, a few older games will false identify here and not reset the counter. Because the game identifies as six button compatible, the fourth pulse group happens, and these are the signals that cause control issues in some games. A couple reasons why some of these older games had issues with the six button controller and false identify are A. The custom chip in the six button is slower to relay the inputs than the multiplexer used in the three button, and some games weren't programmed to anticipate this very slight delay. B. A couple games are incorrectly programmed to read the controller more than twice per frame, causing these games to false identify as six button compatible during the third pulse group. So what exactly does the mode button do if you hold it down when you boot up the game? It tells the internal counter to only use the first pulse group and disregard groups two through four. This ensures the controller never enters into the third pulse group and mistakenly self-identifies as six button compatible. It's a function that could have been assigned to any button on the controller, but understandably so, was assigned to a special out of the way button, so there is no chance of accidental activation. So with that, let's look at some games that are commonly talked about as having issues with the six button controller, requiring the mode button to be pressed when turning on the system in order to play. Using original Model 1 Sega hardware, I tested every game I could find with reported issues, so let's go over every game I could find a problem with and the issues I had. First up is Forgotten Worlds. This game is fairly infamous as starting a game with a gamepad in six button mode gives the player an instant game over. I've read a lot of reports about players not being able to start the game even while using three button mode and did experience this issue as well. However, this was only due to having a six button controller plugged into the second player port. This is solved if the mode buttons on both controllers are pressed while starting the game, or the second player controller is unplugged. Do this and the game will start allowing you to use the six button gamepad in three button mode. American Gladiators is unplayable. You can't leave the title screen as the D-pad doesn't work correctly, and you can't move the cursor right. Carl Ripken Jr. Baseball suffers from a cursor that jumps around like crazy on the password screen and all other option screens. I read a few reports that there was an issue keeping people from advancing their runners from third base to home. So I tried this a few times and had no issues myself. Although moving runners from base to base wasn't extremely responsive. Clue is another game that suffers from the jumpy cursor problem. I would go so far as to say it's unplayable outside of three button mode. Double Dragon 2 The Revenge, a game exclusive to Japan, was reported to suffer from input lag. I believe this to be accurate, 
But to be fair to the six button gamepad, the game controls terrible no matter the controller used. I can't say with 100% certainty, but there does seem to be a noticeable increase in how terrible the game controls without putting the controller into three button mode. Golden Axe 2 is commonly mentioned, more likely than not because everyone who had a Genesis rented or owned this game at one time. The issue here is the movements are mapped, so X is left, Y is down, Z is up, and Mode is right. The D-pad does nothing. I'm curious if anyone has actually beat this game using this setup. John Madden Football is another game that suffers from the jumpy cursor issue, making any selection on an option-based screen very difficult. King of Monsters can't be started. The controller plane just doesn't work. One note people have made about this game is you need to hold the mode button for some time longer than any other game. I have no idea what this means. I hold the mode button, turn on the system, and let it go when the title screen appears. Doing this, I never had an issue entering 3 button mode with this game or any other game I've played for this episode. Miss Pac-Man controls like a dump truck. Asking Miss Pac-Man to move down only works part of the time, making gameplay extremely frustrating, especially if you don't know what's going on. NBA Hang Time makes mention in the manual that 3 button mode is required when using the 6 button gamepad with the multiplayer adapter. In testing controller 1 and 2 were normal, however, controllers 3 and 4 were only partially functional, rendering the game unplayable, just as the manual states. I tested a handful of other games that can utilize the multiplayer adapter and experienced the same issue in these games as well. In Sunset Riders, you can't access the two-player or versus mode while using a six-button controller in the second-player port. I tried a bunch of combinations of 6 and 3 button controllers and didn't have any issues outside of this. The Fairy Tale Adventure is another game suffering from the jumpy cursor issue. I only experienced the issue when dealing with in-game merchants, but it's nearly impossible to make the selection that you want. I want to give honorable mention to Mortal Kombat 2 for the 32X because it does something odd in my opinion. It defaults the controls to the 3 button layout, requiring the user to make the change in options to use the full six buttons. If you're familiar with these issues, I'm sure you've heard of other games having issues that I didn't cover. Here are the games that I tested that were reported to have issue, but tested fine. Most of this list consists of games that were listed as problematic by Sega in their instructions that came with the controller, or made appearances on multiple other lists containing problem games. Air Driver, Alien 3, Arch Rivals, Beast Wrestler, Castlevania Bloodlines, Decap Attack, Exile, Herzog's Y, Jordan vs. Bird, a game guilty of being a terrible game, but no issues when it comes to the six button controller, Pit Fighter, Troubleshooter, Todd's Adventure in Slime World. This game had a few reports of the jumpy cursor issue, but I couldn't replicate the problem. Sports Sock Baseball had a report linking the six button controller to a bug that would crash the game whenever two runners got doubled up on a single base. I doubled players up on different bases a few times and never experienced the crash. Stormlord had reports of people seeming to have issues with the 6 button controller when mapping jump to the C button. I tried it a few times with a couple different controllers and never had an issue. Finally, this video wouldn't be complete without looking at some other games that made use of the mode button as an actual in-game button. Afterburner Complete shows the mode button in the option menu under Key Assign. It's assigned to the Vulcan gun, along with the B or C button, depending on the setup you choose. Aerobiz Supersonic supposedly uses the mode button to display a map. It's not listed in the manual, and I didn't get it to work myself. 
In Batman Forever, holding the mode button allows you to walk backward. You can use this while fighting to move away from an enemy without giving them your back. This might also be a subtle sequel to Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, with MJ starring as the Boy Wonder himself. Battle Corpse for the Sega CD uses it in combination with XYZ as a hotkey to quick select weapons. This gives the player six unique hotkeys mapped to different weapons for easy access. Beyond Oasis, also known as the Story of Thor, uses the mode button plus B to change between your standard sword and the last special weapon you selected on the fly. It's extremely helpful and not mentioned in the manual. With Doom on the 32X, the mode button is required to use all the classic cheat codes. It also allows players to quick select weapons by holding down mode and pressing the button assigned to that weapon. This gives you six hotkeys to pull up the weapon you want on the fly, much like Battle Corpse. Dragon Ball Z, Buu Retsuden, makes use of the mode button as a type of turbo or speed movement ability. When you hold mode, you can move from one side of the stage to the other very quick, while without holding it, you put along at a very slow pace. Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, uses the mode button plus X, Y, or Z to switch between different fighting stances that can potentially be unlocked during a fight. This is integral to the game and is listed in the manual. Eternal Champions on the Sega CD requires the mode button to input the vast majority of codes available for the game, and there's a ton. It's also used to unlock the huge amount of hidden fighters. Nightmare Circus is a game only released in Brazil. It uses the mode button to access a stage select screen and the debug menu. The manual also talks about a special ability being linked to the mode button, but after 30 minutes of playing, I still couldn't figure this game out enough to see what the special ability was. Fatal Fury 2 uses the mode button for taunting, and it is the only fighting game to do so. International Superstar Soccer Deluxe allows players to select strategies on the fly. Holding the mode button while pressing A, B, C, or Z lets the player switch strategies that they have pre-assigned to these button combinations. Metalhead for the 32X uses the mode button to allow the player to change views. In Phantom 2040, holding mode allows you to stand in place and aim your weapon. It's a very handy feature that is executed about as well as can be done without a second D-pad or control stick. I also want to mention how surprised I was that this appears to be a very good game, even with a terrible license like The Phantom attached to it. I really enjoyed the little bit of time I spent with it, and am looking forward to giving it a proper playthrough. Shadow Squadron, also known as Stellar Assault, and Star Wars Arcade both use the mode button to toggle between the cockpit and outside view. Shadow Squadron leaves mode as a dedicated button for this, while Star Wars Arcade doubles up using the X button as well. In Techno Clash, the mode button is used as a dedicated healing button. This game is designed around utilizing the full capability of the six button gamepad and really shouldn't be played without it. The Lost Vikings uses mode as a dedicated button for accessing inventory. It's also discussed in the manual. And finally, WWF Royal Rumble uses the mode button to change your teammate while in the triple tag team match. Thanks for watching the video. Feel free to leave a positive or negative comment letting me know your thoughts. I've had quite an ordeal with my computer leading to its loss and the loss of all data related to what it would have been the next two videos. I'll revisit them at some point, but for now, we'll be moving forward with new reviews. So click the subscribe button if you enjoy the video, and I'll see you again. Until next time, this has been Retro Impressions.